Hi everyone, I'm Craig and I'm here at Colonial Michigan Mackinac in Mackinac City and as you can probably tell it's a very nice spring day here. That means that we are just a couple of weeks away from opening up all of our sites for you to come visit for the summer. Now across our museums and historic sites we have a whole variety of new things. We've got new exhibits, new programs, and here at Colonial Michigan Mackinac you might even see a new uniform being worn by some of our historic interpreters. So let's head on into the fort and talk a little bit more about that brand new uniform that you'll see if you come visit. So if you visited us in the last few summers, you may have noticed that we've been walking through the American Revolution year by year. We started a few years ago in 1775, and this summer we're all the way up to 1780, which is a pretty interesting and exciting time for this community because the move to Mackinac Island was well underway at that point in time. 1780 also marks the appearance of a new group of soldiers here at Michelin Mackinac. Now the garrison of troops from the 8th Regiment that we've interpreted for years, they were still here, but in about three batches, additional soldiers from the 84th Regiment, the Royal Highland Immigrants, started arriving here at Michelin Mackinac over the summer and early fall of 1780. And those soldiers were sent out here for a couple of reasons. One, they were supposed to act as a construction crew to help build that new fort over on Mackinac Island. So a lot of those soldiers were artificiers. They were skilled laborers, uh, wheelwrights, masons, carpenters who could help build that new structure over there. But those troops were also here to help give some legitimacy to the lieutenant governor, Patrick Sinclair. He had arrived here in 1779. He was actually an old officer. He had served in the British Army earlier in his career. But when he came out here as Lieutenant Governor, he had pretty well-defined civil powers, but his military authority was kind of left in question. And to answer some of those questions, in 1780, Frederick Haldeman, the governor of Quebec province, decided to make Sinclair an officer of the 84th and send some troops from the 84th out here to really kind of uh, once and for all confirm that Sinclair was also the military authority here at Michelin Mackinac. Now the 84th Regiment is a little bit different from the 8th Regiment in that they were a Highland unit. They're actually formed in 1775 as simply the Royal Highland Immigrants. They were a provincial unit. So that means that they weren't quite officially part of the regular numbered British Army. They didn't have a regimental number yet. The Royal Highland Immigrants had two battalions, so two kind of separate big subunits uh, uh, within the, uh, the overall regimental heading. The 1st Battalion stayed largely in Canada, and that's where the soldiers that ended up here came from. The 2nd Battalion served kind of all up and down the Atlantic coast and the south and a few other places. Uh, but they were actually placed on the uh, regular British establishment and given a regimental number in December of 1778. That's when they became the 84th Regiment. Now, as that name implies, the Royal Highland Emigrants, they were a Highland unit, and so they had a pretty distinctive uniform. Let's head into the barracks here and actually get a soldier from the 84th Regiment dressed and talk a little bit about their distinctive clothing. Well, as you can see, I've taken off my modern clothes and I'm now here in my 18th century underwear, my shirt and my hose. And before I start to get dressed, before I start to add the other pieces on top of all this, it's important to remember that I'm going to be getting dressed in what is our best understanding of what a soldier of the 1st Battalion of the 84th Regiment may have been wearing here in garrison at Mackinac in 1780. And that's very, very specific. Now, the 84th Regiment and the Royal Highland Emigrants be, uh, before them, their uniform changed over time. And remember, there's a 1st and a 2nd Battalion. There are differences there. And so if the way that I'm dressing doesn't quite line up with maybe what you expect, there's, there's reasons for that. Also keep in mind that there are some things that we just don't know. There aren't a lot of records, especially for the 1st Battalion in garrison like this. There's more records indicating what the 2nd Battalion had been wearing. So some of this is a best guess. It's our best understanding of what this uniform may have looked like. But let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to 1775 when the Royal Highland Emigrants were formed. The order that created the unit said that they were to be clothed, armed, and accoutred in like manner 
with his majesty's Royal Highland Regiment. In other words, they were supposed to dress the same way as this other unit, the 42nd Regiment, which today a lot of people uh, will call the Black Watch. And they too were a Highland unit. And as a result, they had full belted plaids. Uh, they had short coats. They had hose, as you see me wearing here. Uh, and so that's kind of the starting point for what these 84th soldiers were wearing. But again, over time, in different places, in different circumstances, that uniform evolved. So again, we're going for the 1780 garrison look here. Now, at the bottom of all that, again, as I mentioned, is the underwear. I've got my linen shirt on. This is the standard 18th century underwear for essentially everyone. Soldiers would have had several shirts like this uh, issued to them by the government. At one point in the, uh, the mid 1770s, soldiers from the Royal Highland immigrants complained that the quote ammunition shirts, so the government shirts that they were being issued, were of such poor quality that they were willing to pay more to get better shirts. Now, uh, as you'll see in just a moment, as a Highland unit, there will be a kilt that goes with this. And the old question, what does a Highlander wear under his kilt? Well, of course, my underwear. It's just maybe not the underwear that you think of when you think about underwear today. So I've got that linen shirt on against my skin. Down on my lower legs, again, I've got these hose. They're a little bit different than stockings that you might see other people wandering around Mishlamacknaw wearing in that these are sewn. They're bag hose. They're not knit. Uh, so this is actually two pieces of fabric that are sewn together. You can see it's got a red and white dice on it. That's pretty common for Highland units. At different points during the 1770s, uh, the Royal Highland emigrants and later the 84th were actually given orders to cut up their plaids. They're these big giant pieces of plaid material, make a kilt out of them, and to turn the remaining fabric into hose. So this could just as easily be made out of a slightly different style of fabric, the same as my kilt, as you'll see in just a minute here. They are tied with red garters. Those also appear in uh, a variety of different sources, especially the orderly book of Captain Malcolm Fraser, who was an officer of one of the companies in the 1st Battalion of the 84th. Uh, and that orderly book survives and it gives a, a variety of really nice details about what these soldiers would have been wearing. So again, that's the first layer. We can get my cuffs buttoned up, get my cuff buttons, can get my collar buttoned up, and then we can start adding more layers on top of this. So now we can get to maybe the most distinctive part of this uniform, and that is the kilt. Now, the Royal Highland Immigrants and the 84th Regiment were a little unique among some of the other Highland regiments in the British military in that they continued wearing their traditional Highland dress. Uh, some of the other units that maybe saw a little bit more active campaign service they pretty quickly laid aside their plaids and their kilts and some of the other stuff uh, in favor of more practical garments. And the 84th did that to some extent too, as we'll talk about in just a minute. But it seems that throughout their history, they continued wearing some form of Highland dress. Uh, initially, they would have been issued full plaids, uh, again, a very large section of fabric. Part of that would be wrapped around your waist. The remainder of that fabric could be worn tied up on your shoulder, you could very easily flip that up over your shoulders uh, to kind of make a cloak, throw it over your head, keep yourself a little bit warm. But that big chunk of fabric could also be cut in half to turn it into what they may have referred to as a filly bag or a little kilt or simply a kilt. And that's what I have here today. Now, uh, again, this is just a big rectangle of fabric. And you can see that there are keepers or little uh, uh, belt loops sewn onto it. And so I've got it on a belt and this makes it a whole lot easier to put on. There's some evidence that people were using these historically, so this is not a modern invention, but this means that I don't have to lay down on the ground. I don't have to roll around to get this kilt on. But again, it is just a big old rectangle of fabric. So to put this on, all I have to do is put this in the back and you'll note that there aren't any gathers or anything sewn into this. It's just kind of naturally gathered in the back. There are actually three and a quarter yards of fabric in this kilt. And again, that's taken from that orderly book of Captain Fraser. Uh, there's actually a note at one point that the soldiers were supposed to take their plaids and turn them into a kilt consisting of three and a quarter yards of fabric. And then they were supposed to, uh, at different points, either uh, keep that remaining fabric and use it to make hose, as I mentioned, or just set it aside until another use could be found for it. So I'm just going to 
Again, wrap this around myself, get it tucked up there under the belt. So you can see how quick and easy this is to put on. And again, kilts would have been uh, used throughout the 1770s into the early 1780s, basically throughout the entire service life of the 84th Regiment. Uh, and again, this is something that they continued wearing even after a lot of other Highland units stopped wearing the traditional Highland dress. In 1780, and the commanding officer of the 1st Battalion uh, wrote to his superiors asking uh, for additional clothing. He said that they had plaids and kilts in abundance. He specifically said they did not want breeches. Uh, so they wanted to continue wearing uh, this style of dress. And again, you can see there, just kind of gathered naturally in the back. It is a lot of fabric that's just kind of shoved together back there but no sewn down pleats or anything like that. Those would come just a little bit later uh, in the 18th century. Now, they didn't wear these kilts every day. Uh, again, they're not always the most practical, particularly for campaigning or for doing fatigue work, maybe something like building a new fort over on Mackinac Island. They would wear trousers uh, in that, those instances. And trousers start showing up, again, in that Fraser Orderly book in about 1777, and they seem to be issued pretty regularly. They're probably just the same white linen that the rest of the British Army was adopting at that time, but there are also references to trues or to plaid trousers. So you could very easily have seen soldiers wearing trousers made out of this same government set tartan. Uh, but again, I don't have those right now because I'm showing you the more distinctive version. Uh, it also seems that they varied what they wore depending on the day of the week. There's actually regimental orders that said that guards were to be posted wearing their kilts on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays, and the rest of the week guards were to mount wearing their trousers. So on any given day, you perhaps could have seen soldiers uh, wearing a kilt just like this. So with that kilt on, we can now move on to some of the other layers on my upper body. Well, I almost forgot something that still does kind of go along with the kilt, uh, and that is the purse, or what a lot of people will call a sporin today. Those words mean the same thing uh, in the 18th century. Uh, British sources almost always refer to them as a purse, so that's what I'm gonna call it. Uh, and it's basically an external pocket. Remember, my kilt is just a big square or rectangle of fabric. I've got my shirt on. I don't have any pockets. There will be pockets elsewhere in the uniform as we'll see, but this is a pretty useful piece of equipment that just buckles right there in the front. And you can see that my purse is made out of raccoon fur. Now, uh, we're not entirely sure what the uh, 84th or the Royal Highland Emigrants purses may have looked like. There's some portraits of officers that show them uh, wearing what looked to be raccoon skin purses, maybe with a full face mask, so a full raccoon face on the front of it. There are some recollections from an officer writing in the 1820s uh, talking about the fact that the 84th wore raccoon skin purses. Uh, and it is just a pouch that sits right there in front and you can store things in there. It's a nice little pocket space, uh, just kind of helps with the formality uh, uh, of this part of the uniform, helps also kind of keep everything in place. All right, so with our purse uh, belted on, you're gonna notice there's a lot of belts that go into this uniform. I can start to, again, add things on my upper body. We're gonna go with neckwear first before we add anything else. Now, there's a couple different references to neckwear in that Fraser orderly book. At one point, uh, Captain Fraser mentioned the men wearing black leather stocks. At other times, the regimental orders just indicate that the soldiers were supposed to be wearing black stocks. Those could have been made out of velvet, uh, which I have here, just buckled in the back, or perhaps uh, out of horsehair. Those are both relatively common uh, styles of stock. Again, they've got a, a buckle in the back. I'm gonna put my horsehair one on right now. Again, just kind of cleans up that silhouette around your neck, kind of like a tie. Just makes it look a little bit more uniform, especially velvet stocks occasionally had false collars that would be placed on them. So it would look like your shirt was just kind of spilling over the top, but those collars could actually be removed and washed to keep them nice and white. So with the stock on, again, now I can move on to the waistcoat. So the waistcoat is not particularly distinctive. This is very similar to what soldiers would have been wearing 
throughout the British military. It's got two slash pockets there in the front. Just get this buttoned up. It does have regimental buttons, which we'll take a closer look at in a little while here. So I've got my waistcoat buttoned up. You notice I've left the top kind of open there, just decoratively. If I had a ruffle on my shirt, which soldiers occasionally did, that could spill out and just make it look a little bit nicer. I've also put my shoes on. I've just got on my standard military shoes, very similar to what soldiers were wearing throughout the army and similar to what a lot of people would have been wearing in the 18th century. These would have been issued to the soldiers on a regular basis, maybe a couple times a year. Uh, and if they did wear out, there was typically always a soldier nearby, perhaps in your company, who knew how to repair them, how to put a new sole on it, how to repair some of the other leather work. Uh, so these uh, uh, did really last or could last quite a while. So before I put some of my outer layers on, I'm going to get my accoutrements belted on. And the accoutrements uh, consist at the very least of a cartridge box, which is this thing right here. It's just a block of wood with holes drilled into it for rounds of ammunition. This can hold 18. There's also a belt that's gonna go around my waist, as well as a frog that holds my bayonet there. And we'll just get this belted on. And make sure that's secured in the back there. And again, this is the basic accoutrements for these soldiers. They may have changed over time. Uh, in particular, uh, initially soldiers in these Highland units were issued swords. And in a lot of other instances, those other units, uh, especially the ones who saw a little bit more active service, uh, generally those swords were put in storage. They didn't take them into combat. They didn't fight with them. Uh, the 84th or the Royal Highland Immigrants, it's a little bit hard to tell. We can see swords being issued and work being done on sword belts uh, as late as 1778. After that, there aren't a lot of mentions of them. They could have still been wearing them. They could have put them in storage after they get, became part of the regular British establishment, after they became the 84th Regiment. It's really unclear if they would have brought their swords with them out here. Those soldiers who came out here in the summer of 1780 were coming out here in canoes. And again, they were coming out here specifically to do manual labor. They were chosen specifically for their skills related to construction. So they may very well have brought swords with them uh, or they may have left them in storage somewhere else. Something that we do see in other units is them repurposing the shoulder belts, the black leather shoulder belts that you would sling over your right shoulder uh, to carry the sword on your left side. Occasionally those were repurposed to hold the bayonet. So it moved off of this waist belt and the frog there into an external belt. Don't really know what the 84th Regiment would have been doing by 1780. But with my accoutrements on, I can add the regimental coat. This is a little bit different than the regimental coats that you may have seen our other interpreters wearing in that it's quite a bit shorter. There are, there's not nearly as much material in the tails in the back. As you'll see, that allows the kilt or the, the full plaid, if I was wearing one, uh, to really kind of billow out in the back there. We'll get that hooked on. And this has some regimentally distinctive uh, bits on it. The 84th Regiment, and before them the Royal Highland Emigrants, they are a royal regiment, so they are entitled to wear these royal blue facings on the cuffs, the collar, uh, the, uh, the lapels here. After 1778, after the Royal Highland Emigrants became the 84th Regiment, they were authorized to wear an updated button. So all my buttons do actually uh, have a crown, a thistle, and the number 84 on them. Those buttons are evenly spaced. That appears to have been the case in the 1st Battalion. The 2nd Battalion appears to have had their buttons in pairs. So same number of buttons, just arranged a little bit differently. And the buttonhole lace is just plain white. Now this is a, something that a lot of people have argued about for a while. I, for a long time, people thought that this lace had one red and one blue stripe in it in all that white. 
but more current research really suggests that the 84th and a lot of other units that were raised towards the end of the 1770s and into the early 1780s, they were just wearing plain white lace. And that lace with the different colored stripes in it, that's related to a later unit that was also called the 84th Regiment, but really had no relation to the one that we're talking about here. So again, we're not entirely sure about the lace, but that plain white lace and just uh, uh, regular squares, that's probably the safest bet. So that's what I'm wearing here today. Maybe someone will find new information that changes our understanding of what that lace was. But again, that is our best understanding of the historic sources right now. So I've got my regimental coat on. The last thing I need to put on is my bonnet. The bonnet, again, is something that probably changed over time. Uh, initially, the, the emigrants were wearing uh, just a plain blue flat cap. It was a little bit floppier than this. There's actually a, a drawing from maybe 1777, 78, that shows a soldier probably of the second battalion wearing one of those flat caps. But throughout the 1770s, uh, Highland units more and more adopted these raised diced bonnets. So you can see uh, it's uh, uh, got this nice raised portion on it with a blue and red and white check. You can just put that right on your head. It keeps its shape quite nicely. It is cocked there on the left side with another button. It's got a little uh, ribbon cockade, and it also has a couple of black ostrich feathers. Those indicate that I'm a battalion company soldier, so I'm not a grenadier, I'm not a light infantry soldier, just a regular battalion company uh, soldier. So with my bonnet on, I have more or less completely dressed myself. I'm pretty much ready for duty. Again, there are some questions about whether or not they're still wearing their swords, uh, uh, whether or not they, those sword belts have been repurposed to hold their bayonet. But this is the basic silhouette that you may have seen soldiers of the 84th Regiment wearing here at Michelin Mackinac, over on Mackinac Island, elsewhere in Canada, uh, you know, by about 1780, 1781, the time that we're talking about here. Now, if you want a closer look at this uniform, if you want to ask questions about it, I will occasionally be wearing this on site this summer. And of course, we have the rest of our interpretive staff uh, here every day to answer your questions, to lead tours, to perform demonstrations, uh, doing all sorts of stuff to help bring Michelin Mackinac to life and tell you a little bit more about what was happening here in the summer of 1780. Again, it's a pretty exciting time. Not only are there these new soldiers who show up, but this entire community. So not just the soldiers, but all of the civilians who lived here, the men, women, and children, they had to uproot themselves and move over to Mackinac Island. And that's what we're going to be talking about this summer if you do come visit. Now again, Colonial Michelin Mackinac opens for the season this year on May 10th. If you'd like more information or if you'd like to buy tickets, you can visit our website, MackinawParks.com. And we do hope to see you here at Colonial Michelin Mackinac in Mackinac City sometime this summer.